Welcome to Take It From The Iron Woman. My name is Susanne Müller, your host and the Iron Woman. This podcast is about empowering yourself and others to make real changes in the world. You will hear from everyday, smart, sophisticated, hip people like you and me. Not everybody has to be an Iron Woman to impress the world. Together, we will learn from the sports and business leaders how you can become a more successful person as an entrepreneur or a leader. It's one step at a time, one day at a time. Take your steps now. Take your big steps now. Join me on this journey to success. This podcast is being sponsored by Get Loopy. On episode 41, you can hear the story of Isabel, the co-founder and CEO. Get Loopy. Get a 20% discount off your first order. GetLoopy.com. Take it from the Iron Woman. Again, we only have very special guests. And today I'm really honored to have Dan with me. Let me just read off his fantastic resume. So Dan is an associate professor of practice at the University of Pennsylvania and a senior research fellow at United for Alice. Dan's research focuses on income insufficiency and homelessness. And I think I will stop here because we will have everything in the show notes. So Dan, who are you? Who is Dan who is joining us today? Uh, that's a question I work out with my therapist every week. <laughs> I, I'll give a little bit of, of background on myself, and I figure most mm -hmm. of it will come out over the course of our conversation, though. The, the top lines of the resume are, I do research on, I'm a professor at Penn, obviously, and I've been in the public policy, social policy world for a while now, doing research on homelessness, income insufficiency, trying to understand the scope of those problems, right? Mm -hmm. How many people can afford to make ends meet? How many people don't have a place to live? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the depth of those problems and how we can solve them, right? So what are the consequences of not having enough money? What mm -hmm. are the consequences and the causes of not having a place to live? What are the societal implications of that? And then right, how can we actually address that? Mm -hmm. um, it's worked on very kind of big macro level things like universal basic income mm -hmm. or minimum wage, right? What are the consequences of those things? What are the arguments for it and against it? And then in homelessness, something as small as programs like how do we prevent homelessness for this kind of family or that kind of individual that has this kind of problem or that kind of problem, either it's they lost their job or they have a substance use problem. So that's the, you know, most of, of my work. But of course, we met in running class and I like to think of my identity as a runner, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I like to, th but unfortunately that, that identity has, has faded a tad. <laughs> I don't think so, but yes, tell us. So I think we said we met probably in 2007 in running class. There were three guys actually. So it's Dan, Mike and George, uh, right. who were the fast three guys and all were coaches. And I was the running coach for the slower people. So that's how we <laughs> met. So tell me a little bit like, how has the running helped you in where you are or who you are today now? Running shaped my identity. So I kind of made a joke a little bit ago, a little bit ago that my running has taken a, a toll and it turns yeah. out uh, two kids and too many jobs will do that to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But running played a large part in, in who I am. I started doing it in, in high school and it turned out I was pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. And so I went from kind of a kid who wasn't very good at, at most sports to suddenly finding something that I'm good at and that built confidence not just in running, but in other mm -hmm. aspects of life. Yeah. And then I got to keep going with it until I got to make kind of some of my closest friends or people that I've gotten to know, people from high school still. George, who you mentioned before. Yeah. We ran against each other in high school and we lived together in college as, you know, running teammates. Yeah. And then George is the reason I, I ended up at New York Roadrunners coaching with you, oh. is George brought me along. I owe more to George than I will admit to George. Okay. <laughs> uh, but it, it is, it is right, it's how I met my wife. Yeah, uh, I know. So in very kind of concrete and tangential ways, running means a lot to me, mm -hmm. but also it like it shapes, you know, my identity. And I think some of whatever kind of resilience Mm -hmm. I have. I think a large part of that is owed to not just the running, but the dedication and the discipline mm -hmm. that is a, a part of competitive running. I remember the fast three guys. So yeah, these were the days. I agree with you that it boosts your confidence. Yeah, it's also being part of a group. Yeah, just also having fun. I think that's, I remember the rivalry between Dan and George, a healthy, fun rivalry. It hasn't ended. It hasn't. <laughs> it, it, it hasn't ended. 
<laughs> That's right. And, and, it, and it's still helpful to this day, mm-hmm. even if I'm not running quite as much, getting out the door before, you know, before the kids wake up mm-hmm. and getting in a run is a fantastic way to start the day. And yeah. I can tell you that it changes my outlook on the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I might, if I, if I sleep, you know, I go to bed late because I'm working and then I wake up, then I wake up late. I, I know that my outlook on the day will, will not be the same mm-hmm. as a result. And you said you have two kids, so they're two and four, certainly a, a busy time for you. I'm interested, how did you get involved in, or how did you get interested in the homeless population when you started out in your career? So let me go back a, a little bit, because I think this might be helpful for any of your listeners that are kind of like mm-hmm. figuring through their way. And granted, yeah. I was you know, relatively mm-hmm. young, but in college, right, so I went to Penn and I decided I was going to be a political science major. And I kind of wandered for a couple of years, right? Mm-hmm. I was wasting a Penn education because I <laughs> wasn't sure what I was going to do with it. And so I took classes in political science and sociology pretty broadly, but I didn't know if that meant political work, mm-hmm. policy work, and, and wasn't very directed. And then took a single class that changed my trajectory. Mm-hmm. It was a class mm-hmm. on religion and social welfare policy. And I was very interested in the, the social policy, the social welfare aspect of it, and particularly, or as a part of that, right, the role of religion given the conversations and controversies around money going toward religious service providers, with the federal money going to religious service providers. And so I took that class and we started kind of really digging into how our programs delivered to people that, and how our services delivered to people that are, are in need of money or housing or food assistance. And we started reading these evaluations of these programs that worked and didn't work. Mm-hmm. And part of what it showed and this is not something not something that was new to me was like there is a real significant and unmet need Mm -hmm. that isn't being properly addressed and another part of it was a lot of the evaluation work wasn't terribly good and that became my calling and so i then went out looking at uh, welfare to work programs for a while went and, and kind of was taken under the wing of a professor at penn to help me to pursue that work Mm-hmm. And that changed the game for me, right? Him mm-hmm. taking an interest in me and my future oh, wow. has changed my trajectory fundamentally. Yeah. It yeah. led to my next internship, was, which was at the Brookings Institution, he helped me get into the Kennedy School of Government at, at Harvard when he wrote a letter of recommendation, and then helped bring me back to Penn later on. So while I was at Harvard, right, I wanted, I decided I was going to stay in that social welfare world, even if I didn't know exactly what it was going to be, right? Again, like people have overlapping needs, Mm -hmm. overlapping Mm -hmm. and myriad needs. And so whether I worked in the cash assistance world or the food service world or the the housing homelessness world, I didn't care about quite so much, so Mm -hmm. much as I was doing something that would on a high level benefit people that needed a large scale change. And there was a job opening at the Department of Homeless Services in New York City. And that's how I got into it. To some degree, determined determined by me, mm-hmm. to some degree, luck. And that's been it. It turns out it, it is a highly vulnerable and poorly understood group of people, the people mm-hmm. experience homelessness. And they don't have enough people doing work on their behalf, either trying mm-hmm. to develop and understand and, and improve policy, mm-hmm. or just trying to understand their lives and, and trying to advocate for them. And so I've been fortunate to, to stay in that world in a number of positions. Well, we need more of you, especially in today's time. And from your resume, it also says Dan co-authored the first paper seeking to document and project the impact of COVID-19 on America's homeless population. So give us a little insight. Right. We can talk that. about that yeah. a little bit. And mm-hmm. we, I realized after writing that we did, we did more, more projecting than we did documenting because it was so early on. As Congress was negotiating the CARES Act, there were a lot of questions about how much money was going to be in there to help communities tackle homelessness and protect this mm-hmm. highly vulnerable population mm-hmm. who is at risk. We've all heard about stay home to stay safe, but if, you, if you're mm-hmm. homeless, that's not an option. Where do you go? Yeah. Uh, and this is a, mm-hmm. exactly, where do you go? And this is a highly vulnerable population, generally mm-hmm. older and, and getting older. The fact that they're old puts them at high risk. Mm-hmm. Many of them have cardiovascular and other comorbidities, mm-hmm. which puts them at still higher risk. Yep. They're living in oftentimes kind of crowded and congested settings, right? A homeless Mm -hmm. shelter could have Mm -hmm. eight to 10 people in a room or they could be on the streets Mm -hmm. often, right? Without sat, without, you know, proper sanitation facilities. Mm -hmm. So there was a significant concern that not enough was going to be done for Mm -hmm. them. There wasn't enough money in the, in the original bill. And so we put together some projections on how many people kind of could be infected, how many people could be hospitalized and eventually Mm -hmm. die. And then we put together some estimates about what, what it would take to protect them. 
by moving people out of shelters mm -hmm. and putting them into private rooms um, mm -hmm. and taking people off the streets and putting them into, yeah. into private facilities. Wow. And we landed on a number that was about $11.5 billion. And that is both a lot of money and in the scheme of COVID spending, not a lot of money. And I believe that did help to raise the amount of money that was put into the CARES Act. I think it mm -hmm. went from a billion dollars to $4 billion, mm -hmm. which still isn't enough, but it does provide some resources mm -hmm. for local governments and for community-based providers mm -hmm. to, to help this group. And they're a group that is still in a lot of need. So <laughs> currently under negotiation right now with some sort of second stimulus bill, one piece of legislation that's been that's been passed by the House of Representatives, I want to say for a month or two, but still sitting on the Senate floor, mm -hmm. uh, is the Heroes Act, mm -hmm. which includes, among other resources, a hundred billion dollars for housing and rental assistance, and we need that because mm -hmm. we have this extraordinarily vulnerable group that's of people that are homeless now. Well, we don't want this deluge of people that are about to come homeless. We just <laughs> don't have the capacity for it. I know, and it's such a fine line, right? So you said homeless. We think, yeah, those people on the street. I mean. I've seen them in New York. It breaks my heart when I see the hygiene is missing and what have you. They live on the subway. Obviously, the subway has been a little better, but we need more of that. And how many people will lose their home and they become homeless? Yeah. And, and something that I want to say to that is, is, right, so you're seeing people that are on the subways and on, and on the streets. Mm -hmm. And one thing that isn't recognized is, right, you're seeing the people that are visible. In mm -hmm. New York City, it's about, last time I looked, it was about 5% of the homeless population that was on the streets. Yeah. Right? Most oh, people are in shelters. Three to 4,000 people that are on the streets, and it's a much larger number than that, that are you know, sleeping in shelters. Right? Many of them are, in fact, members of families. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's not something that's thought about. Right? When people mm -hmm. think about homeless, they think of you know, the person they just passed on the street mm -hmm. who you know, might have been asking for money, might have had poor hygiene. But in fact, most people that are homeless in fact, keep up their hygiene. They, they don't want people to know mm. that they're homeless. Yeah. And mm. so you actually, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't know it if you passed them. And so many people, like I mentioned, are members of a family with mm. children. Yeah. Uh, we need to think about them when we think about policy solutions as well. Mm -hmm. We need more of you. Thank you so much for all the good work. And we want to promote your YouTube. So you have created a weekly video series called Past the Pandemic. Give a little insight on that. What is that? And how can we support you? Right. So we have created a new weekly show called Past the Pandemic. And what we want to do is highlight some of the conversations that have that have been ignored for too long and are finally coming into the light right now. Right. We are seeing kind of longstanding social inequalities mm -hmm. in income, in race, in, in education status, in, in many ways that are being exacerbated by this crisis, almost as if COVID-19 is preying on specific people. And we want to talk about that and about what that means for beyond this acute moment. Because mm -hmm. I think in many ways, if a post-COVID world looks exactly like a pre-COVID world, we've missed an opportunity. Yes. Um, there's a political scientist at Yale, a guy named Jacob Hacker, who writes about the idea of a critical juncture, which is this rare moment when you can actually make transformative change mm -hmm. in, in, in policy, right? So think of the Great Depression mm -hmm. as a critical juncture in that it produced, among other things, the New Deal mm -hmm. and Social Security, which, by the way, was controversial at the time. Sure. One member of the House of Representatives that called Social Security, quote, the lash of the dictator, <laughs> right? And now that is almost untouchable, right? Any yeah. effort at reform it is right. It's considered the third the third rail of American politics. Right, mm -hmm. you touch it and you die, and that's a mm -hmm. cliche. But there is some truth to it, and so we want we want to bring those conversations on our, any ra on a range of topics to the front of of the mm -hmm. to the front of the debate. Our first episode was about the people that can't afford to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. right? So 40% of American households couldn't afford necessities even before the pandemic. Yeah. And now, right, we've had 17 weeks in a row with more than 1 million new unemployment claims. Mm -hmm. and, ascent and people, low-wage workers have either been kind of laid off and called non-essential mm -hmm. or they've been called essential workers. And so they're still working for low wages, but now in a more dangerous mm -hmm. setting. Yeah. So we, our episode one talked about them and how people mm -hmm. can get involved. Episode two talks about education disparities and just mm -hmm. the ability to show up for school has changed and yeah. technology gaps make it even harder for people without a computer or without high-speed internet or without a safe, quiet place to work to get their lessons and, and do their work and do mm -hmm. things like apply for college and, and mm -hmm. get the resources that they mm -hmm. need. Episode three will, about, will be about the eviction crisis and potential and homelessness. And so we keep hitting on these conversations in mm -hmm. small ways and big ways. Mm -hmm. and so what I hope that your listeners can do is to, to tune in 
and watch it and share their views with us. We have it hosted on, on YouTube. We also share our videos on a website called AverPoint. What, your, what the audience can do there is actually look at the sources that I reference mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in my videos as I say them. And so if you think something is kind of nonsensical, you can dig into my source. And you can say, oh, that does make sense. Or you can go, that's not what that says. He's full of it. And then you can, and then you can tell us that. Oh, wow. And then we yeah. can have a real conversation because I think this is a moment yeah. that begs for debate, yes. but it begs for kind of real fact-based, honest mm-hmm. debate. And we can only do that if, if we're kind of living in the same universe. I think so. Yeah. Right. If if I say COVID's real and you say COVID's not real, right, we can't have a right, we can't have a conversation about that. No. <laughs> but if we can agree on a set of facts or come to some sort of agreement and then have a conversation about what to do with that, I think we can move this country into a into a, the place that it needs to be. I think so. And I was listening into the first episode and I was mesmerized by all the statistics. I mean, I love to do research. I'm a psychologist. By all the research that we like, oh, that makes sense. Oh, that goes together. So please, for the listeners, listen in. And it's just amazing to see where you go and where you get the the statistics and how much it is in our face. And when you say like, yeah, I only see the homeless that are on the street, we realize that how many more people are affected and how many more people will be affected. And it can be somebody of us. So it's, it's a really, it's a time. And when you said now is the time to do something, I think now exactly is the time to do something. We need to disrupt, we need to change and we, it has to be maybe some, something like a little uncomfortable, but that's where we need to go and we need to educate the people and to see the fact. Yeah. The way we live has been fundamentally upended mm-hmm. by the coronavirus. Sure, and so yeah. we have an opportunity, we can do something with that mm-hmm. or, or not. I think we can all agree that we had some room to grow in making the United States more fair, more equitable, and and more just. Mm -hmm. And while we were thinking about the short-term effects of COVID, we need to think about, and and the long-term effects of COVID, Mm -hmm. but also bundle into that the longer-term conversations that we should have been having for years. Yeah, Real good pearls of wisdom, right? Anything else that the listeners can help you with, with creating a dialogue? No, just to share the videos, to subscribe, Mm -hmm. because this only works if it's a dialogue. If it's just me yelling at a, at a camera, <laughs> I'm good at that. I like yelling at cameras, oh, really? uh, but that's not what I, uh, <laughs> I'm too good at. It. But that's not what I want this to be. I think this is, like I said, an opportunity for a conversation among yeah. people that agree and people that, and even more importantly, people that disagree. Yes. And that I, I hope your listeners join us in, in that conversation. Yeah, we will. But thank you so much for all the great work you have been doing so far and keep doing what you have been doing. Thank you, Dan. Oh, thank you so much. It's been great speaking with you what inspiring conversation how can we support dan's journey please sign up on his youtube channel subscribe they have weekly episodes similar to take it from the iron woman take it from the iron woman has episodes every monday every wednesday check in chime in like us and also comment on our episodes and don't forget to get loopy get loopy.com the plant-based snack get 20 percent off of your first order thank you so much for listening take it from the iron woman